Now we're going to take a look at that other form of cell division. We've talked about mitosis. Mitosis is asexual division. It doesn't involve sex. We don't need to make gametes, sperm and egg, and bring them together and make a zygote and all that messy stuff. Instead, with mitosis, one cell splits into two. And if everything goes right, the two cells are identical. That's a quick and easy method of making copies of a cell. But in most organisms, most multicellular organisms, there is also sex. Sex requires meiosis. Meiosis is a special cell division that creates gametes, sperm and egg, and then they come together to form a zygote, and then that zygote develops into an individual. We'll talk about the differences between mitosis and meiosis today, and we'll also talk about why the heck meiosis is even a thing. Why engage in sex? What is the function? What's the benefit of sex? Sex does not occur in all organisms. It occurs in most eukaryotes, although some of them have given up on it, but it does not occur in bacteria and archaea. We talked about bacteria briefly and remember that they have one giant circle of DNA and that big circle of DNA is the chromosome. Most of the information is on there and then they might have a few smaller circles of DNA known as plasmids. But they do not engage in meiosis and they don't have anything that could be referred to as sex. They have something called conjugation which you might touch on in other courses, but it's not technically sex. And that'll make more sense after I define what sex actually is. But in bacteria, of course, they have to reproduce and make copies of themselves. And they do that very quickly. They have this big circle of DNA and what happens is the DNA is replicated. So the DNA is gonna split into two strands. Each strand serves as a template to make a new strand, we've talked about that before, and we end up with two loops of DNA, two giant loops of DNA. Where this replication begins is a sequence of DNA, a spot a location on the DNA known as the origin. The two uh, new loops of DNA will attach to the membrane at their origin, and unfortunately that's not shown on this diagram, but the cell will then elongate and the two loops of DNA are pulled apart. And we end up with two daughter cells that have the exact same information that the parent had. So we started out with one big loop containing all the information. We have two big loops. The two big loops get pulled apart into two separate cells, and we end up with two daughter cells that are the same as the parent cell. This is something known as binary fission. Fission simply means to split. You probably heard of fission in terms of atomic fission. That's where we split an atom to release energy that we can use to make electricity. Not that relevant to this, but fission is splitting. The bacteria simply split into two after they've copied their DNA. As we know, of course, eukaryotes are a bit more complicated. They have organelles, they have a nucleus, and that nucleus contains DNA. The DNA isn't in a big circle, and it's in a bunch of straight or linear pieces, and all of those have to be copied. There are some organisms that just use mitosis. There are some eukaryotes, mostly single-celled eukaryotes, that only engage in mitosis to make copies of themselves. So in the upper left, you're seeing an amoeba that has split into two amoeba. We have two daughter cells from that parent cell. And again, if everything went correctly, they should be identical. Amoeba can reproduce that way, but they can also have sex, and they do it occasionally. We'll come back to why they do that. On the upper right, we have some blood cells. These are white blood cells, the, the two that you see in the middle there that are stained blue, and they're being produced within your bone marrow, within the middle of your long bones, things like your arm bones and your leg bones. Now here we have 
a cell that is reproducing asexually. It's splitting into two. And the whole idea here is that we're trying to replace a worn out cells. So your body maintains itself. It replaces damaged and worn out cells by undergoing mitosis. In the bottom middle, we have the very, very early embryo of a sea urchin. And sea urchins, like all other animals, they start out as a zygote, which is a diploid single cell. And then that divides into two cells, into four cells, into eight cells, etc. That's how you start it. You start it as one single cell. You divide it into two, four, eight, 16, etc., up to 100 trillion or so, which is what you're at right now. But mitosis is responsible for growth and also for repair in multicellular organisms like ourselves. And it can be the main form of division and reproduction in some eukaryotes. That's not the case in us though, as we'll see. There are a number of differences between meiosis and mitosis, but let's take a look at the big one first. In mitosis, we conserve the ploidy number. If we start out with a 2n cell and it divides, we're going to end up with two 2n or diploid cells. Meiosis, on the other hand, always cuts the ploidy number in half. If we start with a diploid cell, we end up with haploid cells. Now for humans, we only have cells that are diploid. Those are most of the cells in your body or haploid. Those are your gametes, the sperm or the egg. In plants and fungi and uh, protists, which we're not really going to touch on too much in this course, there's some weird things that can happen. So just realize in plants, for instance, we might have cells that are triploid. That means they're 3N. We might have cells that are pentaploid. That means they're 5N. We have all sorts of weird things going on, but those cells can undergo mitosis and produce cells that are identical to the starting cell. They have the same ploidy and they should be pretty much clones of the original cell if everything went right. But for meiosis, we half the ploidy number, we cut it in half. And that also means that the ploidy of that cell has to be an even number. It has to be 2n or 4n or 6n or whatever. Again, for humans, and other animals, we don't have to worry about the weird numbers. For humans, we're always talking about diploid cells, 2N cells, but they will undergo meiosis to produce haploid cells, 1N cells. So we are gonna focus on humans and animals. We're animals, of course. And I'm gonna throw a few terms at you here that are rather important. So we're gonna look at multicellular diploid organisms. That's what animals are. We're multicellular, we're made up of many cells. So you're made up of at least 100 trillion cells. We're diploid, that means almost all of our cells are 2N, except for the sperm and the egg that you might contain. We have cells in us that are referred to as somatic cells. Somatic means body. So again, your liver cells, your nervous cells, your um, muscle cells, your skin cells, most of the cells in your body would be referred to as somatic cells and they're diploid. They are 2N. The somatic cells are not involved in manufacturing gametes. So we're going to exclude some of the diploid cells that are found in your ovary and testes. Of course, you only have one or the other. Germline cells. Germline cell is a cell that is either a gamete or a cell that gave rise to a gamete. Now I know the phrase germ is kind of confusing. It's used a few different ways. You're used to seeing the word germ as referring to a bacteria or a virus or something that's nasty and is going to hurt you. That's kind of the common usage of the term. But the term does have other uses in biology, unfortunately. 
So it does get confusing. I think before we briefly touched on germ layers, those are layers of cells in the very early embryo. But what I'm referring to here when I say germline, I'm talking about cells that are either gametes or give rise to gametes. These are cells that are set aside very, very early on in embryonic development. And we'll come back to that. So don't worry too much about this germline term just yet. We will come back to that. And then we have actual gametes. So gametes are the sperm and the egg. Those are going to come together during fertilization and give rise to a zygote. Another refresher here. Remember that DNA is not usually naked. It's not usually found entirely on its own. It's usually associated with proteins. So DNA will wrap around proteins known as histones, and the histones help protect it because it is a very fragile molecule. And also that balls of histones can come together and condense the DNA into something much more compact that can be segregated, divided, during cell division without the DNA getting damaged. In the picture here, we have an electron micrograph, so a quote unquote picture taken with an electron microscope that you can see on the right here. Uh, what we're seeing is DNA that has been copied and those two copies stuck together and then they've been condensed. So again, just as a quick refresher here, in one of these, chromatids here. We're going to have a whole lot of DNA all wound around and I'm trying to represent that. Of course, there would be a whole lot more twists and such, but we have one piece of DNA in here and we have an identical piece of DNA over here. It's a copy of that DNA, but the DNA is all twisted and wound up by its connections to proteins and those two pieces of identical DNA are going to remain stuck to each other until they're pulled apart during the process of cell division. Again, confusingly, a chromosome can consist of one piece of DNA with all the proteins that help support it or two pieces of DNA. If there's two pieces of DNA, that means that the cell has passed through S phase. So it's finished that part of interphase. It's getting ready for division or it's already undergoing division. And we have these two chromatids that are stuck together. So we can have chromosomes that have just one part or chromosomes that have two parts. If they have two parts, then again, we've gone through the S phase, but we haven't finished the separation of those two strands. All right, so what's sex? What's it all about? Why is it a thing? Sexual reproduction is quite different from asexual reproduction in that sexual reproduction has two parents. We have two parents that are contributing material that's being shuffled around to some extent and giving rise to new individuals. Whereas asexual reproduction, we've got one parent that's essentially cloning itself. So with sexual reproduction, we have gametes. We have sperm and egg. They come together. The sperm and the egg are produced by by meiosis. We have that special type of cell division that will cut the ploidy in half. So we get these two gametes that are half the ploidy that come together. And when they're added together, they restore the ploidy of the parents. Meiosis makes sex possible. And sex has been around for a long time. Sex has existed for about 2.8 billion years. So when eukaryotes first appeared, that was one of their first big traits that popped on the scene and proved to be quite helpful.
All right, so here we have a nice overview of the human animal condition. This is what our life cycle looks like. As an adult, we are a diploid organism, so a 2N organism. The vast majority of our cells are diploid, and those diploid cells, for the most part, only engage in mitosis. But there are some, there's a few, that are in your gonads, in your ovaries and uh, your testes, that can undergo meiosis and produce haploid cells. And those haploid cells are gametes. Those haploid cells can come together through a process known as fertilization. If you want to be really technical, it's also known as syngamy. Syn means fusion, gamy refers to gametes, so the gametes are fusing together. But this process of fertilization or syngamy is going to create one cell known as the zygote that is diploid. And then that undergoes mitosis to create the diploid individual, the diploid adult. Before we take a closer look at the steps of meiosis, let's compare it to mitosis. I'm hoping at this point you have a pretty decent understanding of mitosis. And to learn meiosis, I want you to think about how they differ. One of the big differences, as we've already discussed, is that meiosis produces haploid cells. Another big difference is that meiosis has two divisions. We have one cell that divides into two, and then those two cells divide again to give us four cells. There's no DNA replication between those two divisions. There's no new S phase. So we aren't making more DNA. We're just cutting it down again. And that's why we end up with the haploid condition instead of the diploid condition. There's another thing that happens, and that's that the DNA is recombined. We'll talk about that in more detail, but basically DNA from sister chromatids, chromatids that contain the same information, is swapped around. And that gives us some variability in the daughter cells. The final cells are all a little bit different. They're not simply clones of the first cell. This is an important diagram, so please take a bit of time and look at it and make sure it makes sense to you, and I'll, I'll go through it now. We have a parent cell, and in this case, we're dealing with an individual that has a condition or situation, 2n equals 4. And what that means is in their diploid cells, they only have four chromosomes. Now, that's not the case for humans, of course. Our condition in terms of ploidy would be 2n equals 46. We have 46 chromosomes. We could also say that n equals 23. In our gametes, our sperm and our egg, we have 23 chromosomes. But this is, you know, simplified. Keeping track of 46 chromosomes would be a bit difficult. So we have a simple cell from some hypothetical animal where the cells in the body, apart from the gametes, have four chromosomes. There's two sets of information. One came from the father, let's just say that that's the blue chromosomes, and one set came from the mother, let's say that that's the red chromosomes. And now they have to be divided up. So let's look at mitosis first. What's gonna happen is that cell is going to enter into um, into S phase, and that DNA is going to be replicated. So you can see here we have, wow, that's a bad arrow, but we have a cell that started out from that parent cell. Now it has twice as much DNA. It doesn't have twice as many chromosomes though, because remember chromosomes can consist of two parts or one part but it has twice as much DNA. And now what's gonna happen during metaphase is that those chromosomes are gonna line up along the middle of the cell, along the metaphase plate, and it's random as to how they do that. 
they're going to attach to microtubules from the spindle and the chromatids are going to be pulled to opposite poles. We're going to end up with two daughter cells down the bottom here that are identical to the parent cell. You can see they're exactly the same. Now, what if that cell, that parent cell, was contained within the ovaries or the testes and it underwent meiosis? Well, what would happen is the DNA would be replicated, but then during prophase, very strangely, the chromosomes that now consist of two parts, two chromatids, they're going to pair up. So you can see that here, they're going to pair up and they're going to result in something known as a tetrad. Tetra means four. So we have four chromatids all together. So each tetrad has all the homologous bits of DNA. Now, what does homologous mean? It means the same. All the bits of DNA that have the same information are all packed together into a tetrad. So the homologous chromosomes have come together. There are two divisions to meiosis. In the first division, the homologous chromosomes are gonna be pulled apart. The chromosomes, again, consist of two parts, the two chromatids, and they're gonna be pulled apart. And that's gonna give us what we see down here in anaphase and telophase of division one. So the Roman numeral one there refers to the fact that this is occurring during the first division of meiosis. In the process, there's some crossing over. Crossing over refers to the fact that bits of information are exchanged. We'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. And then the second division results in haploid cells that only contain one set of information. So remember when we did mitosis on the left, we started with a cell that had two sets of information. We ended up with two cells that both had two sets of information. Alrighty, let's take a look at the particulars here. Starting out, meiosis and mitosis look pretty similar. When we're talking about interphase, remember that we have G1, S, and G2. G1 is a cell that's just doing its thing. It's not necessarily getting ready to divide. It may receive a signal that tells it to enter into S phase. S phase is where it becomes committed to division. That's where the DNA is divided. So the chromosomes that only consist of one part in G1, after S phase, they will consist of two parts, two chromatids. So leading up to meiosis again, exactly the same. We have DNA that's divided during S phase, and then that's gonna lead us into our prophase one of meiosis. The really big differences between meiosis and mitosis occur during the first prophase. Now again, in mitosis, there's only one prophase. In meiosis, there's two. So let's take a look at what happens in mitosis and I'll try to draw that here and I'm not an artist and I'm doing this with the mouse so I'll do as good a job as I can but during mitosis what would happen is the chromosomes would line up along the metaphase plate and I'm going to draw them in two different sizes I'll do a long and a short so these are chromosomes that have different sets of genes on them. And the red is the ones that you have from your mother. The blue is going to represent what you have from your father. How they line up is random. So I've shown one possibility here, but they could line up in other ways. They're going to attach to the mitotic spindle. 
again, we're looking at mitosis here in this example. And again, excuse my artistic abilities. But what's going to happen is those individual chromatids are going to be pulled apart during the one and only division of mitosis. If we look at meiosis, during that first prophase, things are quite different because what happens is homologous chromosomes, those are chromosomes with the same information, they all come together. So we have one chromosome here, we have another chromosome here, and again, how they line up is random. But all of the homologs, all of the chromatids that have the same information from your father or from your mother are going to line up together. They attach to the mitotic spindle. Oops. And in this case, the chromosomes themselves are going to be pulled apart. So during our first division, we're going to have chromosomes that go to one end or the other. There's a second division. The chromatids are pulled apart during the second division. We have what are called uh, chiasma or chiasmata, and this is where we have crossing over occurring as well. So in the diagram to the right, you can see that there are areas like this, like this, where we have the exchange of bits and pieces of DNA. And that gives rise to chromosomes that are new. We haven't added information, but we've rearranged what chromosome the information lives on. During metaphase one of our first division of meiosis, again, we have tetrads that consist of these four chromatids connected to each other. Again, that would be a structure like that. We can also refer to this as a bivalent. That's a term you might come across. It means the same thing. But what has to happen now is the homologous chromosomes need to separate. So on the second pair here, let's just look at that. We have one chromosome here. We have another chromosome right below that, and they have to separate. Now, before they separate, what happens is this exchange of material between the two chromosomes. Once that has been resolved and accomplished, then those chromosomes are going to separate they're going to walk to opposite poles. What they actually do is they walk along those microtubules that make up the mitotic spindle and they move to opposite poles. So in anaphase, we have the chromosomes separating and you can see the chromosomes at the top there. They contain bits and pieces of the chromosomes below and vice versa and they're separating and they're ultimately going to move to opposite poles of the cell and then the cell is going to undergo cytokinesis as we talked about before and separate into two cells but the chromosomes that result are a bit different from each other in anaphase the chromosomes are going to be pulled apart so the chromosomes here still consist of two parts, two chromatids. Now again, that's different from what happened in mitosis because in mitosis, the chromosomes didn't align themselves into tetrads. So we're pulling apart chromosomes that still consist of two parts, two chromatids. Also note that we have some exchange that's happened some genetic recombination. We'll talk about that more in the future. But we have this exchange between non-sister chromatids that occurred before the chromosomes were pulled apart. As we enter into telophase and cytokinesis, 
the chromosomes have moved to opposite poles, opposite ends of the cell, and the cell is starting to pinch off into two cells. Now we're going into a second division. That's not something we see in mitosis. Depending on what organism we're talking about, the nucleus might reform or it might not bother. But either way, we're starting off with half the number of chromosomes in the second division, but the chromosomes consist of two parts this time. They consist of two chromatids, and they're going to be pulled apart. So we have the second division. There wasn't any replication of the DNA between the first and second division. The chromosomes are going to line up in the middle of the cell, and the second division of meiosis looks a lot like a typical mitotic division. So all of those chromosomes consisting of two chromatids are going to line up in the middle of the cell, and they're going to be pulled apart. The chromatids are going to migrate to either end of the cell. And we end up with four cells. We had one cell to start with. It was diploid. It divided once. DNA was not replicated. Those cells divided again. And we end up with four haploid daughter cells. Each one of these cells is distinct from the other cells. And the reason for that is that bits and pieces of information have been exchanged between non-sister chromatids. Now let's just take a look at the timing of meiosis in humans and other mammals. It's really kind of fascinating because there's a big difference when it comes to males and females in this regard. Males are simpler, so let's start there. Down the bottom, we've got what happens in a human male with respect to you know, when they make gametes, when they undergo meiosis. So in the very early fetus, which is on the left here, we have a population of cells that are set aside as germline cells. Those are cells that are going to end up within the testes, the male gonad, and they're going to undergo meiosis eventually to produce sperm cells. They don't do that right away though. So we have this population of cells that is segregated into the testes, and then when a male hits puberty, those cells will undergo meiosis, the two divisions, meiosis one and two, and generate sperm cells. And they do that all the time. So human males past the age of puberty are going to produce sperm cells constantly. And those sperm cells are stored in a structure called the epididymis. Don't worry too much about that. But males always have this collection of uh, gametes that are ready to go. In females, things are quite a bit different. They're, they're more complicated. In females, what happens is we have some cells that are set aside in the very early uh, fetal stages, and those cells are going to be segregated into the, the ovaries. What happens is that those cells start meiosis. They start meiosis before you're even born, if you're female. So the cells in your ovaries that will give rise to eggs have already started meiosis before you're even born. Quite different from what happens in males. But they only go partway through meiosis one. They don't complete that division. Now, when you reach puberty as a female, what will happen is one of those eggs from one ovary will continue meiosis. It will receive a message saying that, okay, let's develop a bit further. And they will go uh, further into the divisions of meiosis one. They are released into the fallopian tubes or oviducts and they travel down towards the uterus or womb. If a sperm cell is present and makes contact with that cell, then meiosis II will occur and complete 
And then after that, we can have the nucleus of the egg, the nucleus of the sperm cell coming together to produce a zygote. Now there's one kind of complication that comes from this. For females, you have egg cells that have already started through the process of meiosis, but haven't finished. And they're held at that state for a very long time. So they're interrupted, they're arrested in this process of meiosis. They have a mitotic spindle that's involved in that process, it's possible for all of that to get damaged. And that's why for human females, if you were to uh, give birth later in life, especially after 40, there's a higher risk of genetic disorders, uh, specifically aneuploidy, which we'll talk about in a moment, because there's been this long waiting time where the spindle and uh, the other machinery of meiosis might be damaged, but that's something uh, we'll come back to later on. One of the things that can go wrong during meiosis is something known as non-disjunction. This is where the chromosomes or the chromatids don't separate properly. So again, meiosis is much more complicated than mitosis. There's a whole lot going on. There's two divisions. There's more opportunity, unfortunately, for mistakes and accidents to occur. There are two divisions of meiosis, of course, and there are two opportunities for separation of chromosomes or chromatids to go wrong. Let's take a look at non-disjunction in a bit more detail here. So non-disjunction in meiosis one is shown on the left here. And we can see that we have one pair of chromosomes shown at the top of the cell there that have divided normally, but we have another pair that have not. They've remained stuck together. So it could be that they're not separating because there's some proteins in the middle here that just won't simply go, they won't simply give up and allow those chromosomes to separate. Or it could be that the mitotic, or sorry, meiotic spindle has attached to both of the chromosomes and pulled them both in the same direction. But either way, we end up with one cell that has an extra chromosome because all of those chromatids for the second chromosome went in one direction. And we have, of course, another cell that has a missing chromosome. This is a problem. So let's say that this is what's happening within an ovary. These are the egg cells that we produce down the bottom. We have two egg cells that have an extra chromosome. We have two egg cells that are missing a chromosome completely. The missing a chromosome part is a bigger deal because of course we're missing an entire big chunk of information. Each chromosome has about a thousand genes on it and this particular gamete, this egg cell, doesn't have that information. Now let's take a look at the example on the right. Here we have a cell that underwent a normal division in the first meiosis, but in the second division, the chromatids didn't separate. So this, on this side, on the left, is all normal, but on the other side, over here, this is abnormal. This didn't work properly. We end up with one cell that has an extra uh, chromatid, and we end up with another cell that has one fewer than it should. So in this situation, we end up with two abnormal gametes and two normal gametes. Now, regardless of how this happened, let's say that these gametes, these egg cells, it's more likely to be egg cells that have this problem, are released into the oviduct they travel through the oviduct or fallopian tube and they meet up with a sperm. So let's take the example of these cells here 
or this cell here, they meet up with a normal sperm cell. Now, when that happens, we're going to end up with what's known as aneuploidy in the zygote. Aneuploidy means that you have an unusual number of chromosomes. So we have two of this particular chromosome coming from the egg cell. We have one, of course, of the homologous chromosome coming from the sperm. We end up with three chromosomes for that particular uh, chromosome instead of the two that we should have. This is problematic. You might be wondering how it could possibly be bad to have an extra copy of information. Well, let's look at one example here. It's the example you're probably most familiar with, trisomy 21 or Down syndrome. In this particular case, you have an extra chromosome. The chromosomes, as we've talked about before, can be identified as 1 through 22, and then you have your sex chromosomes. You have an extra copy of the 21st chromosome. Now, that means that you have more genes that code for that set of proteins. Remember, every gene codes for a protein. On average, each chromosome has about a thousand genes or so. So you've got this extra information that is being decoded and then turned into messenger RNA and then that's being read by ribosomes and you're spitting out more protein than you should. Most of the proteins in your body are enzymes and that means that particular pathways, particular metabolic pathways, biochemical pathways are more active than they should be because you have more enzymes. And that is going to disrupt your development. It's going to mean that cells in the embryo are focused on things they shouldn't be as focused on. And that's going to bring about developmental changes. And unfortunately, those are, those are bad changes. They tend to have effects on the development of the brain, the development of cognition, and so on. There are, other, there are other examples of aneuploidy. They're not typically ones that result in viable embryos and viable individuals, unfortunately. If you're missing information, that tends to be even worse, as you might expect. So in many cases of aneuploidy, the embryo doesn't even develop to term. So in most cases of aneuploidy for other chromosomes, uh, we don't see the development of a fetus that survives to birth. Back to the big question. Why bother with sex? Why does sex exist? Meiosis is more complicated. It's messier. There's more things that can go wrong. Why bother? It's not about reproduction. If I told you it was about reproduction, I'd be lying. Terrible, terrible pun on the photo here, which I'm not going to discuss any further. If your goal is just to make as many babies as possible, sexual reproduction is maybe not the way to go. Sex is messy, as we've talked about. It's complicated. Meiosis is complicated. There's a lot that can go wrong, and we need to have two parents that come together to produce those offspring. Asexual reproduction doesn't involve finding a mate. It doesn't involve meiosis. You're just making a clone of yourself. Now, it might surprise you to learn that there are many vertebrates, those are organisms with a backbone, like us, for instance, that can actually reproduce asexually. One example is lizards. There are some species of lizards that can reproduce sexually or asexually. They have a choice. If they're reproducing asexually, they just make a clone of themselves and the entire population is female. Now, how does that work? We've talked about the formation of a zygote before. They still form a zygote, 
sort of. But what they do is they have cells in the ovary that undergo mitosis to produce a diploid cell, and then that diploid cell develops into a new lizard. With sex, of course, if these lizards decide to have sex, there has to be males and females. The males produce sperm, the females produce egg. That comes together to produce a diploid zygote. But regardless of whether it's sexual or asexual, the zygote is going to develop the same. So let's compare the two strategies that we see in these lizards. So with sexual reproduction, we have to have two individuals coming together to produce offspring. With asexual, every single lizard is female and they produce their zygotes by mitosis and they produce clones of themselves. Now let's just pretend just for the sake of argument that every uh, mating opportunity, every reproductive opportunity results in two offspring. If we look at sexual reproduction, we would have two individuals coming together and producing two offspring. The population would not grow in size over time. We would just be maintaining the population, best case scenario, but due to predation and due to just death in general and bad luck, the population would probably shrink in size. Now in the asexual situation, every single lizard can produce two copies. The population would grow over size. So again, it's kind of an artificial uh, hypothetical example I'm giving here, but you can see that with asexual reproduction, every single individual can produce potentially quite a few offspring, whereas with sexual, we have to have two individuals coming together to produce anything at all. So again, with our example here, where every reproductive event results in two individuals, our asexual population would grow very quickly. Our sexual population would not grow at all. In fact, like I said, it might shrink slightly. So why on earth would we want to have sex if the point is to make copies of ourselves? If we're looking at evolution, we're looking at species competing with each other and trying to dominate over other species, why would we favor sexual reproduction over asexual reproduction? The reason is kind of complicated, but the main reason is variability. If you are reproducing asexually, you are making a clone of yourself. Every individual that you spit out is gonna be exactly like you. Now, if you take your information and mix it with someone else's information, you're gonna have offspring, babies, children, that are different from either of you. In fact, every single individual that you produce is going to be a little bit different. Maybe you're really successful uh, in a Darwinian sense, in a fitness sense, but maybe you're not. If you can spit out children that are all slightly different and the environment changes a bit, some of them are going to have advantages that you didn't have, that uh, your mate didn't have. It's going to lead to a lot of opportunity. So what we're seeing here, these are aphids. These are little tiny insects that you might've come across if you've looked very closely at plants. They're very common. And what they do is they live on plants. They have little piercing mouth parts, kind of like little hypodermic needles, and they'll stick that into the plant and they'll drink the plant's juices. I mean, if you're a gardener, if you're growing roses and stuff, you probably hate these guys, but they're everywhere and they feed a lot of stuff. I think they're pretty cool. They are fed on, they're eaten by a whole bunch of different things and they reproduce as quickly as they can to survive. What you're seeing in the bottom left is a female aphid that is giving live birth 
to a new aphid. During the summer months when things are good, all of the individuals are females. We have females that give birth to new females. They do that asexually. They produce zygotes by mitosis and they spit out this new baby that's a clone of them. But what's really interesting is at the end of each season, late fall, they will produce some males. The females will produce a few males and the males will mate with the females. And when they mate, they produce eggs. And that's what you're seeing in the lower left. Those eggs will survive the winter and they'll give rise to the next population next winter. So during the summer, things are really, really good. The whole strategy, the goal of the aphid is to produce as many babies as possible. They do that asexually by giving live birth to new females. It's a process known as parthenogenesis. It's really, really fast, so they can spit out as many new uh, babies as possible. In the fall, they engage in sex, which is a slower, messier, more complex process. They have to go through meiosis to produce sperm and egg. The females and males have to find each other, come together, but they produce these eggs that last through the year. The eggs, again, are the result of sex. So sex is where we have two partners coming together to produce new individuals. But next spring, when these eggs hatch out, every single individual is going to be a little bit different. And that's key here, because who knows what it's going to be like next year? Maybe next year, certain plants are going to be readily available while others aren't. Maybe there will be more predators of one type versus another. Maybe if you have a slightly different uh, color, you might be better camouflaged because there's you know different types of plants, different predators that can see different things. Who knows what's going to happen next year? So having that variability means that you're not putting all your eggs in one basket, so to speak. Hopefully, some of your babies are going to succeed next year. This is a theme for a lot of invertebrates. If conditions are good, there's lots of food, they're happy, they're going to reproduce asexually because it's faster. They don't have to find a mate, they don't have to do meiosis. What you're seeing at the top here on the right is something called a hydra. And a hydra is like a sea anemone, but these things are small. They're about a centimeter in length, but they have the same kind of structure. So at the top of this critter, we have tentacles that can grab onto stuff. We have a mouth in the middle that will eat stuff. And these are things that you find in local ponds. If you go out in the summer and take a look at the underside of a lily pad or something, you'll see lots of these little tiny guys if you look closely attached to the underside of the leaf. They reproduce asexually and that's what you're seeing here. So we have a little bud, a new individual that is literally just growing off of the body of this hydra. Imagine if you could do that. Imagine if you could grow a new human asexually off of your hip, it would grow and then it would just pop off and go about its life, do its own thing. That's what we're seeing right here. And that's how these hydra reproduce for most of the year. Now, once the lake gets cold or the pond gets cold and uh, we're entering into winter, what they do is they produce males and females, the males and females mate, and just like we saw with the aphids, they produce these eggs that will withstand the harsh conditions of the winter and give rise to new individuals next spring. Again, the whole point is we want variability because we don't know what things are going to be like next year. Things are always changing. If we look at mammals like ourselves, we do this as well, but we do it all the time. We don't switch between sexual and asexual reproduction. We've just focused on the sexual reproduction. What you're seeing on the bottom here, this is a bit of an outdated 
uh, a diagram here, but this is from uh, one of the earlier versions of your textbook. It's been estimated that any pair of humans can produce about 8 billion or so different offspring, different children that are different in some way. That's larger than the population of humans on the planet. So if you pair up with a mate, you can have 8 billion or so different combinations of offspring, a huge amount of variability. They're different from you and they're different from your mate. They are a recombination of you and your mate. And that is due to the recombination that occurs during prophase one of meiosis. Now on the far bottom right, I've got a picture there of two spiders. They're actually of the same species. So a lot of spiders, the black widow spider would be an example of this. The female and the male are quite different. This is something known as sexual dimorphism. Di means to, morph means form. The sexes are different. The sexes are different in humans as well. It's not as pronounced as it is in a lot of insects where the female is very, very big. She's big because she needs to lay eggs. That takes a lot of energy to do that. Egg cells are very big. And the male is typically much smaller. And in something like a black widow spider, the male and female do things that are somewhat different. So the female and the male might have different life strategies. Uh, in the case of black widow spiders, as you've probably heard, the female will try to eat the male after it's mated, because after it's mated, eh, not that much use to the female, really. It's already done its job. But the male, if it's really, really clever and really, really quick, it might be able to mate with a couple of females. So we have a situation here where the males and females have different traits that are being selected for but they're both traits that are helpful. So we have a situation where having males and females performing slightly different roles helps the species or helps the offspring on the whole because we're, we've got different selective forces acting upon the male and the female that are selecting for different positive traits that are both passed on uh, to the offspring of the two. There's one other thing to consider. So variability is the big thing here. Variability and the fact that males and females may do different things and may evolve in slightly different ways that can help both males and females. But the other thing is that when you have sex, you have an opportunity, the only opportunity you have, to compare your genetic information to somebody else's information. And you actually have a chance to correct for any deficits, any problems. When you produce your gametes, basically what you're doing is you're taking information from your mother and your father. So let's say that on this diagram here, your mother's information is in red, your father's information is in blue. That information has been separated in your cells up to when you make your own gametes. In the cells that undergo meiosis, the information from your mother and from your father come together and we have the swapping of bits and pieces. It's the only time this occurs in your body. This creates gametes that are different. And of course, your mate is going to produce gametes through the same process. They come together, we get a zygote that's got a different arrangement of genetic material than either parent. But one thing that's kind of interesting that happens during your making of gametes is that you have this opportunity to compare your father's information to your mother's information. The genes line up right alongside each other one by one and your body can look for errors. Maybe there's a gene that has a mistake in it 
And that can be compared to another set of information, another gene from your other parent. And there's a chance here for your cells as they're making gametes to correct mistakes, to kind of uh, proof the information, to check it against other information. So meiosis also allows you a chance to proofread, double check your information and make sure it's okay. And there's one last chance here to correct mistakes before that information is passed down to the next generation. And once again, that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing crossing over. We've got information from your mom, information from your dad, and this is being compared. And there's one last chance here for enzymes such as DNA polymerase to correct any mistakes that there might be. Once again, the main purpose of meiosis is to cut the ploidy in half. Imagine if we didn't do that. Imagine if we created diploid gametes, diploid sperm and egg. When they came together to create a zygote, the zygote would be 4N or tetraploid. And let's say that that generation did the same thing. They created gametes that had the same ploidy. 4N, 4N, they'd come together, they'd produce a new generation that was octoploid, 8N. This would spiral out of control and pretty soon all of our cells would be occupied by DNA. They'd be mostly DNA. So every generation we need to cut the ploidy of the gametes down to half the value of the cells that made them so that we can recreate the diploid condition in the next generation. This process of meiosis occurs at different points of the life cycle for different organisms. We'll look at animals first, we're animals, and this is actually the simplest process. This is the simplest life cycle. In humans and other animals, we have ovaries and testes that produce haploid gametes. They come together and that produces our zygote. So that process where the sperm and the egg come together is known as fertilization or syngamy. We get a diploid zygote that's going to develop through mitosis into the adult. So the diploid zygote is going to divide to give rise to two cells, those divide into four cells, those divide into eight cells, etc., until we have the hundred trillion or so cells that make up the adult. This is just a simplified version of that. We have a diploid multicellular organism. That would be you, for instance. You are multicellular. You're made up of many, many cells. You are diploid. All of those cells are diploid apart from the gametes. In the testes or the ovary, we have meiosis producing gametes. Gametes from two parents come together to produce a new generation, a new zygote that is a combination of you and someone else. And then that zygote, which is diploid, undergoes mitosis to produce a new adult. Other eukaryotes, plants, and fungi have a more complicated life cycle. In fungi, they have a haploid multicellular stage. That's how they spend most of their life, most of their life cycle. Occasionally, they'll produce haploid gametes through mitosis. Remember, mitosis can occur in a cell of any ploidy. And those gametes come together and create a diploid cell that immediately undergoes meiosis to bring them back to the haploid multicellular phase of their life. So they're basically the opposite of animals. Plants have a haploid multicellular stage and a diploid multicellular stage, and they alternate between that. But you can pretend that you never heard that because we're not gonna get to that in this course. That's something that hopefully uh, we'll talk about again if you take another course with me or you'll hear about in another biology course. 
But in all cases, eukaryotes, especially multicellular eukaryotes, tend to engage insects at least occasionally. They engage insects so that they can take information from themselves and another member of the same species, compare the information, look for problems, and also combine the information and rearrange it and create offspring that are different. So with animals, we are diploid. That means we have two copies of each chromosome, one from your father, one from your mother. The gametes are haploid. I put usually there because it's not always the case in plants, but we, we can ignore that for our purposes. Syngamy or fertilization is where the cells combine together and we are back to our diploid condition. So the sperm and the egg come together and we're back to the diploid condition back to a diploid zygote that can develop into the next member of the generation. Mitotic divisions always conserve the ploidy. So if we start with a 2N cell, we end up with a 2N cell. And meiotic divisions always cut the ploidy in half. So we start in us with one diploid cell that is going to give rise to four haploid cells. And finally, we have our terminology for this topic.